Hey everybody, happy Saturday. How's it going? Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast with me, your host, Harry Simiou. And again, we've got a fair bit to get into. We're going to talk William Saliba. We're going to talk Declan Rice. We're also going to discuss a number of transactions taking place between a select group of Premier League clubs and what that tells us about how things are going in the Premier League. We're going to bring you an update on Sambi Lakonga's future. We're going to talk about that report that we mentioned a few days ago with regards to Victor Gyokores and the fact that that particular outlet are not letting this go. They are convinced that a deal is happening between Arsenal and Sporting. For him, we'll bring you the latest on that. We're also going to talk Michael Alise and we'll bring you an update on Joshua Kimmich's future. There have been some suggestions earlier on today that actually he's on the move and that Arsenal are among those at the front of the queue should the German become available. But we'll bring you the latest on his future. We'll give you an update on that as well. All on this edition of the Chronicles of Aguna. Hope everyone's good. Hope everyone's having a good weekend so far. Um, strange weather here in London today. It is pretty warm. Um, but it's really cloudy and there's been showers of rain throughout the day, which have made it impossible to stay outside and enjoy the warmth. And instead, we've been coming outside and then running for shelter inside and then coming back outside again. It's been a mess. Um, but I am at the time of recording this currently sitting in the man cave, um, having done my uh, fatherly duties this morning, running the kids around to their various activities and all the rest of it. And now I'm sitting here and I'm chilling and I'm watching uh, Georgia against the Czech Republic. I know Georgia knocked Greece out of the playoff round um, and therefore denied Greece entry into this competition. But I'll tell you what, they've captured me in terms of um, me wanting them to do well. They're a fantastic side. Um, they're, they're great to watch. They play with so much heart, so much spirit. Right now, they're winning the game by a goal to nil. But whether that will last or not, I don't know. But I'm intrigued to see how they get on. Of course, Czechia would be out of the competition if, of course, uh, they lose this game. They've been underwhelming, haven't they? But, well, I thought that they would be better than they were. But then when I started to look into their squad and people were talking to me about how inexperienced some of those players were, how young some of those players were, I started to think that, yeah, maybe they are going to crash out at the first hurdle. But anyway, we're not here to talk about Czechia. We're here to talk about the mighty Arsenal. And let's start off with William Saliba. <laughs> William Saliba played for France last night in their nil-nil draw with the Netherlands, a game that some people have uh, described as dull, the first disappointing encounter in this competition so far. I didn't actually see it like that, to be honest. I thought it was a, a gripping game. I thought it was a game that um, could have gone either way. It was a game that um, I was glued and hooked to. There was that one controversial or semi-controversial decision, of course, depending on how you look at it. Xavi Simmons thought he'd scored what would have been the winner for the Netherlands, only to have it chalked off uh, for somebody standing in an offside position and potentially blocking where the goalkeeper could dive into. It was interesting because this one took an absolute age. The decision took an absolute age to be reached. And then you look at who the officials are, and it's Anthony Taylor and his team of UK-based officials and you kind of just went yeah well of course it's taken a while but that's not what I wanted to talk about today I just wanted to talk about William Saliba because I think watching him at this tournament watching the way he slotted into this French national team because going into the competition not many gave him a chance of being in the starting 11 he's found his way in Didier Deschamps in a press conference after the game when asked why he had sort of usurped Konate and taken his place in the back line just said look I picked the best players and William Saliba's come here and shown us all that he's ready. 
He's playing at left centre-back for France as well, rather than right centre-back where he normally plays for Arsenal. And I was intrigued to see how he would kind of adapt to that. He's played there before in his career, but obviously it's not something he's done for a good couple of years now. So to see him slot in there and do so well at this level has been really, really encouraging. I know in an ideal world, a lot of us would say in a tournament like this, in a competition like this, best case scenario, wrap your players up in cotton wool, hope that they don't play much football, hope that they don't get too many minutes and hope that as a result of that, they come back fresh for you uh, in the new season. But I think in William Saliba's case, you know, this is great because this is his first experience of a major tournament. It's his first experience of being one of the starters in that French defence. And just imagine the confidence that will give him. Now, he's been on this incredible journey. He's talked during this tournament, actually, about the decision to let him go out on loan to Marseille and actually how his time at Marseille was essentially the making of him. He's come back to Arsenal ready, kicked on, pushed on even further. And now I would go as far as saying that we're looking at one of the best centre-backs in the world. I think you could make the case that on current form, William Saliba is the best centre-back in the world. I genuinely do believe that. I think he is up there. I mean, I can't think of too many that are better than him or have been better than him over the last couple of years consistently. People will throw the name Virgil van Dijk in there, I'm sure. And of course, there's still a case that Virgil van Dijk, who's achieved all that he's achieved, is still ahead of William Saliba. But you look at some of the others around. You look at some of the other players that are spoken about in that category. And I just think that William Saliba, based on the last couple of years, is right up there. And if someone was to sit here and say he is the best centre-back in the world, I don't think you could put too strong an argument against that forward because he's that bloody good. And it's great to see and I'm delighted to see him performing the way he is for his national side. OK, another Arsenal player that I want to discuss is Declan Rice. He's had a lot of stick since England put in that really dire performance against Denmark. Some people have looked at him as the problem and said, well, Declan Rice isn't doing enough in terms of playing the ball forward. I've seen compilations going around online at titled all the opportunities Declan Rice had to play the ball forward and he didn't. Um, I've seen some people go after Trent Alexander-Arnold. A lot of people accused me of doing that. I was, you know, called out on social media, apparently, for um, going after Trent Alexander-Arnold, which wasn't what I was doing. I, I made the point yesterday. What I was trying to say was that you can't put a fullback into midfield and expect him to have all of a midfielder's habits just like that. And the hypocrisy that Gareth Southgate has shown has been actually quite frustrating. He kept telling us, didn't he, that Phil Foden couldn't play through the middle because actually he didn't play there for his club. And I looked at... Trent Alexander-Arnold's Premier League season last season, 28 appearances for the Reds, 28 appearances at right back. So, um, you know, uh, it, it's interesting, isn't it, that Gareth Southgate's gone down this route. Look, at the end of the day, it's not on Rice and it's not on Trent Alexander-Arnold either. Gareth Southgate is picking a wrong midfield. Now, could you make the case that England don't have the Tony Kroos, the, the Luka Modric, the Jorginho, the ball controller? Absolutely. But I, I still think that Declan Rice and Trent Alexander-Arnold are being made to look worse because the managers picked a really unbalanced side. And I just wanted to touch on some comments that came from James McLean. Um, you know, not always known for speaking the most sense is James McLean, but he was on uh, Irish television on RTE Sport. And he said, I think he's very overrated talking about Declan Rice. And I just think to myself, like, it's OK to sit and say that um, you know, Declan Rice isn't the controller that maybe England need. And, you know, he isn't going to help you build out from the back in the way or as effectively as some of the other players on the continent. And maybe that's something that England are missing. If you wanted to be hypercritical of Declan Rice and you wanted to highlight some skills that maybe, you know, he doesn't have um, to such a high level, then that would probably be fair. And, and I have said that myself in the past. So I don't have a problem with people saying that. I do have a problem with people saying that he's overrated, though, because we've seen that when he's playing in the right system with the right people around him, there's very few better in world football than him. Um, I would make the case that only Rodri is better than him. And I think, you know, we've been talking a lot on this pod. Will he be a six? Will he be an eight going forward? I think he probably will be an eight. I think some of those reports that we're hearing are probably quite accurate. And I think that Mikel Arteta probably would 
you, you know, use the same sort of reasoning to kind of justify that. He'd probably say, look, incredibly good across the ground, physically um, really imposing, really hardworking, got a great attitude, has added a goal threat to his game, has added a bit more creativity to his game, but probably isn't that tempo dictator that maybe the very best sides need, uh, and particularly when they're facing low blocks and wanting to have uh, domination, as Mikel Arteta likes to put it. So it's fair to say that there are some things that Declan Rice isn't as good as uh, or as good at, I beg your pardon, as some of the others. But to say he's overrated, full stop, and that be that is just ridiculous. And, you know, James McLean is, is James McLean. You know, we've we've heard many wild things come out of his mouth over the years. So I'm not massively surprised by it, but I felt the need to defend Declan on this one. I want to talk now about some deals that are said to be taking place between some Premier League clubs all of whom, what a coincidence, are close uh, to breaching the PSR rules. And this is, this is just, it, it's funny, you know, because I, look, I've sat here before and I've said I like the, the fact that there are some regulations around the Premier League. I like the idea of rewarding clubs for being well run. I like the idea of um, the playing field being a little bit more level so that you do see um, coaching make a difference so that you it's not a case of, well, they've got the best players. There's no way they can be beaten. There's some jeopardy because you've got teams um, that, you know, can't go crazy in the transfer market as a result of some of these restrictions. Um, and yeah, I, I've always said that we need some kind of financial caps and limits in the Premier League, right? So don't have a problem with PSR. But what this is doing, um, th these group of, this group of deals that I'm going to touch on in a second, what this is doing is just showing you that the Premier League have tried to do something about this, but their policy, if you like, their regulation, their restrictions are not watertight because clubs will just find a way around them. And I think the biggest mistake that the Premier League did was allowing player sales um, involving those that are homegrown, if you like, to go down on the books as pure profit, because then what you see is overinflated deals, which is exactly what we're seeing now. Um, this is a tweet that I've brought up from Rory Talks Football. Um, Matson has joined Villa um, from Chelsea. Kellyman is joining Chelsea from Villa. Dobbin is joining Villa from Everton. Irobunam is joining Everton from Villa. Calvert Lewin is seemingly on his way to Newcastle from Everton. And Minter is moving from. Um, Newcastle to Everton. And all of those deals are on course to be done before June 30th, which means that all of those clubs are getting players that I'm sure they want, of course. But all that, if you look at some of the prices that have been quoted, and again, look, these deals are not confirmed yet, so I can't know this for sure. But they all look like they're being done at overinflated prices to help these teams get around the PSR problems that we all know them to have. And I just think, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I remember recently somebody saying, or, or many people actually saying, that there was a bit of a red cartel at the top of the Premier League. And that's what was causing Manchester City problems. It's why the Premier League have, you know, gone after Manchester City, in their words, um, because the, the red cartel of Arsenal, Manchester United and Liverpool don't like the new status quo and all the rest of it. I mean, this sounds pretty dubious to me and it sounds pretty contentious to me. So maybe the cartel isn't red. Maybe the cartel is blue, um, claret and blue. And maybe there's a bit of black and white in there uh, as well. I don't know. Um, I'm just throwing that out there. I, I just look, I'm not saying that any of these deals are illegal, but it just shows you that if you leave uh, loopholes open, people will expose them and people will work them to their advantage. And it looks like all of those clubs are doing a little bit of that. And all of those clubs are going to be helping each other get through an issue around PSR. So look, I'm not as outraged by it as a lot of people. I'm not going to point fingers at the clubs and say, you know what, you guys are crossing a line in the way that maybe people will say Manchester City have, given that they're facing 115 financial charges. What I will say is this is a loophole that is open. They're taking advantage of it. And actually, if you really want these regulations to make a difference, then you need to close those loopholes 
and you need to be a little bit more watertight in your approach. We've heard so many people come out. So Jim Ratcliffe, who's now obviously a, a shareholder in Manchester United, has been talking about how these financial restrictions are going to cripple the Premier League. I mean, I, I just find it all crazy. You know, when I'm hearing it from people involved with football clubs that have spent billions of pounds on dud players over the years, like actually they should be wanting to spend more responsibly. They should be wanting uh, to run their clubs in a far more efficient way. And so, yeah, like just get over it, whatever. Um, the restrictions are there for a reason. I do think they need adjusting. I do think they need tweaking. Um, but it's just interesting to see that a load of Premier League clubs are seemingly ganged up to try and get around this. According uh, to uh, reports that we heard earlier this week, Arsenal were just... Uh, a whisker away from getting a deal done for Victor Gyokeres. Only the financial minor details uh, were left to be resolved. That's what we were reading uh, just the other day from the Portuguese outlet Leonina. And uh, they have uh, continued to push this narrative that Victor Gyokeres is close to joining Arsenal by saying that Arsenal will not pay the release clause of a hundred million euros for Gyokeres. Allegedly, an agreement has been reached at 90 million euros with Sporting Lisbon. But if uh, all the variables, all the clauses that are included are met and they are related to goals and the participation of the player in the Champions League, it could eventually go up to a hundred and twenty million euros. That's what Leonino in Portugal are saying. I've still not heard from anybody here in the UK that this is correct that this is accurate um i don't ever want to look at any source really and say you're talking nonsense and completely dismiss them and i don't know anything in not enough about this outlet to say you know good or bad or whatever um but this is not going away this story they're going to be made to look really silly in the not too distant future or they're going to look like geniuses if this does come off but they are a sporting based outlet so there's a possibility that maybe they have an in that you know people in the UK don't but I just I find this quite difficult to believe I've got to say that um just while we're on the subject of of transfers I know we've got a couple of others to talk about as well but I did want to quickly touch on Albert Sambi Lekonga I haven't got an image uh, ready to go for him because he's just popped into my head now uh, but I did read yesterday that Sevilla have opened up talks with Arsenal over the potential of taking Sambi Lekonga on loan uh, to Spain. Now, he does have a couple of years remaining on his contract. So if he goes to Sevilla for another year um, or, or for a year, I beg your pardon, so goes out on loan for another year, then he'd be returning to the club with just a year left on his contract. I mean, in an ideal world, I think we should probably sell Sambi Laconga now. I think we're at that point. We we realise that it's probably not going to be the solution to any issues that we have at Arsenal. Um, but he's had a relatively good loan spell at Luton Town, which should have done something in protecting his value to a point. I, I'm not saying we're going to get what we bought him for. Um, but if he goes to Sevilla and has another good season, yes, maybe his value increases slightly. But then the contract situation, the fact that he'll be going into his final year with Arsenal would actually probably counteract that. So I don't really know whether this is the right thing. I think if I was Arsenal, I'd keep my options open at this moment in time. I'd rather sell him. So I'd probably want to hold out and see if any other offers come in um, and how the landscape looks after the European Championships. Um, but interesting to know that they're interested. And if it is a case of keeping him and letting him rot in the sort of um, the, the depths of the squad next season, then it is better that he goes and plays at Sevilla. And I actually think that's a good club to go to if you're someone that's looking to maybe rebuild your reputation a little bit. OK, uh, let's talk very quickly. Michael Olise. Now, we spoke a little while ago about Michael Olise, a very talented individual who's on many clubs radar uh, this summer, understandably. Um, and we knew that there were a number of clubs that were looking at him. Manchester United, Newcastle were mentioned, uh, Bayern Munich were mentioned. And in an exclusive yesterday, David Ornstein revealed that Michael Elise has chosen to join Bayern. They were among three clubs uh, to have contacted Crystal Palace last week. Chelsea and Newcastle, the other two, uh, apparently. And now he's expected to um, move to Germany 
with Bayern and Palace expected to agree a deal for the 22-year-old whose contract does have a release clause. Bayern looking to rebuild and they see Michael Alise as a central part of that project. It is a bit of a shame, I think, for the Premier League that somebody of his talent is going to be leaving, is going to be moving on. But it just goes to show, doesn't it, that Bayern still have a huge pull. Chelsea and Newcastle, the other two clubs that made contact. Newcastle didn't have a great season, I didn't think, last season. And I think if they struggle in the first half of the 24-25 campaign, people are going to start to ask questions about that project and if Eddie Howe is the right man to take them forward. So are they hugely stable as a result of that? Probably not. Um, you never want to sign for a manager that's you know potentially on his way. Sometimes you just don't know and you can't avoid it. But if you get that feeling that perhaps Eddie Howe won't be there, and I'm not saying I know he won't be there, but it's just a feeling I have, uh, given that the Newcastle project didn't really continue on its upward trajectory last season, then that would maybe put me off of going there. And Chelsea, well, you know, if you'd have told me Chelsea under Maurizio Pochettino after their strong end to the season, I'd have probably been, if I were a player, quite optimistic about where they could go next. But they sacked him and they start again with Enzo Maresca. And we know that there's no stability at Chelsea whatsoever. So I'd probably swerve that move as well. Um, and so Bayern, I guess, of these options, feels like the best one. They're embarking on a longer term project under Vincent Company. And I think of all the clubs that we've mentioned, Bayern are probably the ones that are most likely to see that out um, or at least give him a season. Um, and that's not really saying much about Bayern because, you know, they've been known to be quite trigger happy with managers in the past as well. But um, Newcastle's situation is a strange one. Chelsea's is, is a crazy one, as it always is. So I can understand why Michael Elise has chosen to make this move. Let's move on to our final story of the day. And it concerns Bayern Munich's Joshua Kimmich. Now, ever since we got to kind of January of this year, there have been lots of whispers and murmurs about what's going on with Joshua Kimmich's future. Arsenal have been linked on multiple occasions with him. Very versatile player. I still think he's best in midfield, but we've seen him play at right fullback quite a lot in recent years. Does a bit of a Trent Alexander-Arnold role of kind of inverting and going into those half spaces. Wonderful set piece taker. Great cross on him. Great eye for a pass. We know that he's got an incredible skill set. He's won a lot with Bayern. Um, has plenty of experience, has plenty of quality and would certainly add something to our squad. But I read some suggestions earlier today that actually, yeah, you know what? It's all done. He's leaving Bayern and Arsenal are among those at the front of the queue to potentially pick him up this summer. Now, here's an update that came from Stefan Kumberger um, earlier today on Sport One. He said, Joshua Kimmich is currently not thinking about leaving Bayern. Obviously, he's at the Euros, and he said repeatedly that his focus is on that. Um, the report goes on to say that he's not too concerned because he's in a comfortable position, knows that he's got great prospects of finding a top club once his Bayern contract expires at the end of next summer. If he leaves on a free, he can expect a massive signing on fee. And I've said for a number of years now, and, you know, Arsene Wenger predicted this years ago that we would get to a point where players were actually quite chilled and relaxed about um, running their deals down because the signing on fees mean a huge payday for them. Rather than two clubs exchanging a fee, there will be a fee that goes to that player. You know, people were talking about Real Madrid signing Kylian Mbappe earlier in this uh, summer already and saying, well, you know, amazing, they got him for free. Well, they haven't because they're going to pay him an absolute fortune in terms of signing on fees and image rights and all the rest of it. So that could benefit the player. Um, this does all say, though, um, or this does also say, I beg your pardon, that within the club, however, they can certainly uh, see him being sold this summer. Um, you know, they've, they're have they making an effort to reduce the wage bill. Kimmich's salary uh, is also something that's being discussed at the club as he's one of the top earners in the squad. He would be willing to speak to Bayern about an extension, but would also like to see more positive signals from the management with Erbel and Freund. Uh, so far, the club's bosses have generally not spoken much about the current players and instead have been focusing on a rebuild. So he's not cut himself off uh, from the potential of re-signing for Bayern, um, but it's also very realistic that Bayern are going to let him go uh, in the summer. Would I welcome him at Arsenal? Absolutely, with open arms. I think he's a top, top player. Uh, but just to kind of conclude on that and to summarise on that, there's no 
progress in terms of Arsenal and Kimmich. There's no conversation going on between the club and the player. As far as I'm aware, there's no conversation going on between the club, our club that is, and his representatives as far as I'm aware. But there is a possibility that he moves on in the summer. What would the fee look like? Not sure, but obviously anybody that goes in hoping to do this deal will be boosted by the fact that his contract will go into the final year, which puts Bayern in a bit of a shit situation in terms of negotiating and all the rest of it. But there's no indication that he is someone that is A, at the top of Arsene... I knew you said Arsene Wenger because I mentioned him earlier. Bloody hell. Uh, Mikel Arteta's list. And B, there's no indication, um, you know, that that we're going to seek a deal with Bayern Munich to bring Joshua Kimmich in. Would I take him personally? Yes, quite like the player, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen. I wouldn't get carried away on this one. And I just wanted to bring some context to some of the rumours that I've seen swirling around on social media today. Some insisting that we're in conversation and that the deal is definitely going to happen. And it's a case of dotting the I's and and, and crossing the T's. It's a bit like the Gyokares thing. I think people are just going a little bit early. And I do keep saying this. I don't think you'll get too much significant movement in terms of those major deals from an Arsenal perspective anyway, until after the European Championships. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Chronicles of a Guna. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you're with us on YouTube, if you're listening on audio, please do leave us a review and subscribe too. It really, really does help. Uh, is Saliba the best centre half in the world right now? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Is Declan Rice overrated? Of course he's not. What's James McLean on about? Uh, the deals that are being done uh, by the new Premier League cartel. Uh, we'll talk, uh, or we did talk, I beg your pardon, uh, Sambi Laconga. Could he be on his way to the Ramon Sanchez Pithuan? Uh, Leonina are not dropping the Gyokares story. Uh, they are adamant that a deal is going to happen between Arsenal and Sporting. For him, Michael Elise has made his decision in terms of where he's going to end up. And just a bit of context there on the Joshua Kimmich reports. I will see you all tomorrow on the next episode. Until then, take care of yourselves and have a great day. Goodbye. 